Hey, honey. Yes, Barry? Let's get out of here. Where are we going? Where do we always go? Hasta encuentra la playa Por eso grito al mundo Yo soy de Puerto Vallarta Samba de Puerto Vallarta Noche de arrullo en el mar Samba de Puerto Vallarta Travel Show. I'm your host, Eric Kessler. I'm just so happy to be introducing you to my favorite vacation destination. Hey, maybe it's even yours, and that's Puerto Vallarta, Mexico. That music you're listening to is performed by Alberto Perez. And Alberto is the owner of the Lapa Lapa Group of Restaurants. Those are the Lapa Lapa, Puerto Vallarta's oldest restaurant in the famous Los Muerto, Muertos Beach, and the El Dorado Restaurant and Beach Club right next door. So, you can enjoy that fantastic view of the Los Muertos Pier, all lit up at night in beautiful colors, or during the day in its grand splendor for breakfast, lunch, or dinner, seated with your toes in the sand right at the water's edge. It's so romantic. It's so Puerto Vallarta, my friends. Uh, this week, we visit with friends of the show, some old friends of the show, as a matter of fact, uh, and friends of Puerto Vallarta. we got a familiar couple, Jimmy Pluff and Frankie Victoria. Uh, you know them best from the Vallarta Food Bank, but the food bank has a new name. It's Vallarta Cares, and they're going to explain the reason for the name change and also fill us in on the amazing things that they're doing there for the patasaladas that are in need, Vallartensis. Uh, speaking of repeat guests and friends of the show, we're going to have Edgar Rivas. He's going to be telling us about the Brewmasters Festival that's coming up this weekend. Uh, actually, today and tomorrow, November the 16th and 17th at Parque Hidalgo. Uh, he's going to be talking craft beers and food and music and special cocktails, local and, uh, well, international. Uh, Edgar's always a lot of fun to talk with. Uh, we're going to have lots of Vallarta news and more, so let's get Let's see what's happening this week in Puerto Vallarta, the 16th of November, 2024. Once again, I am coming to you from the balcony of an Airbnb overlooking the Zona Romantica with views of the ocean and the jungle and random firework shows every night. In fact, uh, this evening I've already seen five. We've seen five of them from here. Uh, we are located above Casa Kimberly and uh, and the Iguana Restaurant there, and we can hear the mariachis down there playing um, every night for the diners. It's really lovely, and uh, it, it's it's just an added extra bonus of sitting way up here. And you know, you might yeah you might hear some noises. Uh, I've never uh, I've never recorded in the night, so we'll see if we. Hear barking dogs or street traffic or you know, some sirens. But so far, I've uh, been able to filter out most of that background noise. I want to thank Reggie and others who let me know that the audio from the balcony actually sounded okay. Because uh, I, like I was telling you, um, I, I, I used to listen to it in my car and I don't do that. I can't do that anymore. So anyway, we are loving our Airbnb and we really love our Airbnb host. Really nice man, Lars. He's really, you know what? I'll share the Airbnb link just as soon as I feel that it's safe to do that with you guys. I'll, I'll check out the pictures. The view's beautiful. They'll be in the show notes. And, um, with Dia de los Muertos in the rearview mirror, high season is officially here in Puerto Vallarta. Well, it's getting here. Uh, more tourists are arriving every day. There's cruise ships sailing in and out, like two or three, or I don't know, four of them a week. There's a lot of them. Uh, Canadians are arriving by the plane loads, trying to escape the snow and the cold and nasty weather up there in Canada, and Americans, they are also arriving from those upper reaches of uh, the nation. 
as uh, winter is fast approaching there, too. So, uh, yeah, also the Christmas holidays, they are fast approaching here in Puerto Vallarta. And, uh, but before that, that all starts coming and before Santa Claus comes to town here, um, still the, the big giant Katrina is still on the Malacan. And uh, at the last moment, she got a big, she got a huge doggy, a big dog uh, on a leash. And uh, there she is. And it's really cute. And uh, all the all the smaller Katrinas are still on the Malacan, at least for now. So catch them if you can, if you're still in town or if you're going to be in town in the next, uh, probably the next week or so, they're, they're going to have the Katrina up there. It takes a long time to set that up. I'd be really surprised if they knocked it down any sooner than that. Uh, And while you're on the Malacan, in fact, uh, well, all around town, you're going to be noticing uh, something that you haven't seen before. These blue poles with a button that you can push if you're in trouble. Uh, You know, they're panic buttons to make you feel safer. They are uh, called emergency response poles or totems. Uh, And like I said, they're blue with the word alerta prominently displayed in white letters along with panic button there. And uh, they actually have surveillance cameras and speakers built into them as well. You know, cameras and speakers, that sounds a little bit interesting. Anyway, uh, let me put on my little little tin hat here. if it gives you a nice warm feeling inside and makes you feel safer, isn't that cool? It's really nice. So anyway, I wonder how many drunk calls that these folks manning the system are going to get. I mean, what could possibly go wrong, right? Uh, I said a few weeks ago that the new administration in Puerto Vallarta is facing money shortfalls and that they're looking for ways to fix that. And one, one was to raise the water rates, which they did. Uh, They also are still thinking about raising property taxes on properties in tourist zones in in Vallarta. uh, That hasn't come around just yet, but uh, now they have news that's spreading, and it is in the newspapers, and now it's it's happening. Uh, They proposed a tourist tax of 270 pesos, or approximately $13.50 U.S., on foreign visitors. Uh, so the city officials are expected to, uh, well, they, they think it's going to raise between 250 to 300 million pesos a year. And uh, they're, they're going to use that money to fund the city's tourism infrastructure, they say, and uh, and services uh, with, with that particular tax. So uh, they met this week to discuss and to fine-tune that plan. I understand that the tax doesn't affect residents, uh, just visitors. Uh, so we'll see how it all shakes out as far as the co- cost of it and uh, and how they're planning on collecting the tax. Now, interestingly enough, when I was uh, doing some researching on this, uh, on the new Vallarta tax here, I stumbled on a, a very similar story. In uh, It's happening in Quintana Roo. And uh, what then they've been doing this uh, since I think uh, 2020, and it's called a uh, VC tax, and it's uh, 224 pesos. It's a mandatory fee that's charged to visitors over the age of four. Uh, and uh, it says here in the article that you can pay the tax by going online at www.vctax.gob.mx or uh, at kiosks around uh, the airport there in uh, Quintana Roo in, uh, I guess, Cancun. Uh, It says here all foreign tourists are required to pay the tax and the taxes are said to be going towards public services and uh, the new tourist attractions. Uh, uh, That's got to probably include the train Maya, I would imagine. Anyway, uh, it seems that the new administration here is looking at what they've been doing in Cancun, uh, like I said, since 2020. So we'll talk more about this next week after they finalize their plan. I'm not going to, you know, figure out what's going on there. They'll figure it out, and we'll we'll talk about it later. Uh, the Vallarta Art 
walk is back. So every Wednesday from six o'clock until ten o'clock, uh, you you're encouraged to to visit some of the uh, nineteen different galleries uh, located in the central historic area of uh, Puerto Vallarta. Uh, they'll have places with sculptures and paintings and jewelry and ceramics. Uh, it's just beautiful artwork in El Centro. It's you, There's some walking involved, so uh, be ready to put on some comfortable shoes. Uh, a lot of the galleries actually have treats for their visitors, like wine or little bites or something like that. Anyway, it's a great way to, to pass some time and to meet some incredible artists out there. So I have a link to the Art Walk website where you can you can print up a map and you can discover the 19 different galleries and speaking of art walking uh galleries in the zona romantica are making their own art walk for their side of town and uh here is an article from the banderas news uh puerto vallarta mexico this friday november 8th so this happened uh earlier in uh, in the month they had their first one here, and, uh, November 8, 2024. The heart of Puerto Vallarta Zona Romantica will light up with Arte Zona Romantica, a bi-weekly cultural event blending art, music, and community, running every other Friday from 6 o'clock till 9 p.m. through April 18th of 2025. This lively gathering invites locals and visitors alike to explore a world of creativity in one of Port of Vallarta's most cherished districts. Once known as the South Side Shuffle, oh yes, we remember the South Side Shuffle, uh, Arte Zona Romantica was created uh, through the combined vision of artists, musicians, and dreamers who have made this part of town a haven for creative expression. Uh, with 19 participating galleries and studios, the event provides a unique way to stroll through the district, discovering art that reflects both local and global perspectives. Uh, not to be mistaken for the Wednesday evening art walks, this event offers a distinct experience that celebrates the spirit of the Zona Romantica's eclectic community. Galleria Dante, Puerto Vallarta's largest art gallery, will mark the season's start with a special Meet the Artists Night, uh, guests can enjoy complimentary cocktails while meeting these distinguished artists whose works span diverse lifestyles and inspirations. After taking in the art, visitors can relax with wine and tapas at uh, Divino Dante, an inviting wine bar perched above the gallery's sculpture garden. Uh, open through Saturday from 1 till 10 p.m., Divino Dante offers creative cuisine and cocktails, making it a perfect spot to unwind. Throughout the season, Arte Zona Romantica will feature live music, performances, and refreshments, turning each Friday night into a celebration of artistic expression. Uh, in addition to popular spots like Sandra Shaw's Jewelry, uh, Kathleen Carrillo Galleries, and Peyote People, the area also boasts a variety of nearby shops, restaurants, and smaller galleries that make this event a true community affair. Uh, Arte Zona Romantica is more than just an art walk. It's an invitation to experience the creative pulse of Puerto Vallarta and to discover hidden treasures in one of its most beloved neighborhoods. Uh, so yeah, now Zona Romantica has their own bi-weekly art walk, and uh, I have a link to that article. A uh, big Big article in the show notes uh, and a map of the route and the participating galleries in, uh, again, in the show notes. Uh, now, of course, uh, all the markets, they're all back in full swing. So that Saturday morning market over at Tile Park is rolling again. Thursday's uh, marina market that they have over there in the evenings. That is uh, going once again, you know, the one over in La Cruz de Juanacuaxle. They, I think they got one over at uh, the uh, the harbor as well. Anyway, I'll have a list of them. I'll, go, I'll post them in the show notes. But they're all, they're all moving. They're all happening again. And, by the way, it's talking about all happening again. All your favorite bands, they're all back in town. They're all on schedule. They've all come back from Canada. 
where they go and, you know, they tour, uh, you know, when it's uh, really hot here. Uh, and, uh, the La Horta Barbecue, uh, which uh, was, of course, formerly the El Rio Barbecue, they have made a ton of improvements. You would be amazed if you haven't seen it yet. Uh, they've got a new stage area there. They've got beautiful new bathrooms. And, you know, I'm going to rave about the bathrooms, right? Sure, why not? You know, uh, even I think, uh, well, according to Debbie, uh, you know, they had uh, toilet seats. So, you know, what are you going to do? Anyway, they have uh, pickleball courts, which is amazing. And I'm going to have uh, Jesus Garcia. Uh, he's going to be on the show in a week or two to talk about the changes and, you know, and the, and, and the toilet seats. No, and the pickleball, the pickleball. We're going to talk about that. This could be fun. Anyway, uh, lots of changes on Isla Quale are happening, including uh, the pending grand opening of Le Bistro Jazz Cafe. Uh, so um, if you're anywhere near the Isla, you remember where that place was, and get down there, stick your head in there. It's just drop-dead gorgeous. Anyway, I'm going to be... Interviewing Sophia Boitner from uh, Grupo Lapa Lapa. She's going to tell us all about the remodel job. And we'll go over the menus. And she's going to fill us in on all things uh, new and old over at Grupo Lapa Lapa. Uh, it's going to be a big boost for the Isla Quale, that's for sure. And a feather in the cap of Grupo Lapa Lapa, I'll tell you that. Uh, anyway, I'm going to have Sophia on next week's show. Uh, so stand by for, actually stand by for, um, some Facebook posts. I'm going to have some live Facebook posts from the restaurant when Sophia gives us a pre-opening tour. It's going to be pretty cool. Watch, watch for that. Uh, and you know, check out the, the Puerto Vera Travel Show Facebook page if you haven't already like it and follow it. Uh, anyway, Debbie and I. We had a wonderful opportunity to meet and hobnob with um, a Vallarta Creators Group. I mean, wow, I mean, I couldn't turn that down. Now, as many of you know, um, you know Ada and Stefan, I had them on the show, they have a, a show, a YouTube channel actually called Living Simply in Mexico, uh, where they talk about uh, when they walk you through actually life in Puerto Vallarta, among other things. So... Anyway, um, actually, like I said, they were on the show years ago, in fact. And anyway, they invited Debbie and me for drinks and snacks at their casa over in Gringo Gulch, just down the street. And uh, wait, wait, just down the street, at least for another month or two, that is, until they kick us out of our uh, Airbnb. And um, while we were there, um, they invited other uh, creator people. They invited Brent Lane and his wife, Laura. Now, Brent Brent does a show uh, called CPS News with Jesse and Brent, uh, among other projects. It's, a, it's an English language news show. The studio is in uh, the marina. And anyway, I'm going to have Jesse and Brent on the show really soon, by the way. And and also Audra with Naked Jag Jaguar Tours. You may have seen uh, her YouTube channel. Uh, anyway, um, anyway, a lot of you have actually told me that uh, I need to have uh, Audra on the show. And so, yeah, I'm going to have her on the show, too. And anyway, Ada and Stefan, um, you know, popped out a camera and uh, started filming. <laughs> so uh, uh, they've got a clip of us, uh, me and Debbie, and and the whole group of the, these creators uh, in their latest episode of their YouTube show. So I'll embed it in the show notes. So, uh, it, you know, listen to it, watch it, I mean, and uh, subscribe to their channel if you haven't already. And uh Actually, in that same episode, they do something really fun. They walk you. They take you like for a, a walk, like a little step-by-step -step from Los Muertos Beach uh, all the way to Conscious Genus to a restaurant called La Playita, a nice, lovely restaurant right there, uh, right on the beach uh, in Conscious Genus, uh, you know, among other things. It's a great uh, it's a great video. They got some uh, Dia de los Muertos parade action in the video, too. So, uh, anyway, have a look if you haven't already, and it's in the show notes. 
dengue is in the news. It seems like a lot of it is going around here. Um, Actually, Jalisco leads the country with a total of 16,000 this year. Of course, we're at the end of the year, so uh, we'll just round it down to 16,000. Anyway, I actually had an interview. He, you know, someone um, called me. He canceled because uh, he uh, came down with uh, with the dengue. So it's a you know it's a good thing to remember that uh, the the mosquito the mosquito the mosquito that uh, carries uh, dengue uh, is more of a daytime feeder. Uh, just be aware that uh, you know. You should you should be using mosquito repellent, especially if you're, you know, if you are going to be going up in the jungle or hiking or going down to the beach in the morning. Uh, make sure if you're at the botanical garden, uh, wear that stuff. If you are in Mismaloya, wear that stuff. If you're in Boca, wear that stuff. Uh, and when I say that stuff, the uh, the repellent. The best one to get is uh, is the local stuff, the local off-brand, not the kind that you get at home, uh, but the, the stuff that you buy here. Uh, and uh, use it, like I say, when you when you go on those hikes or, or do that stuff, remember. And uh, remember that uh, mosquitoes, they appear generally at dawn and at dusk, and there you have it. So just beware. Uh, the dollar, the dollar's been getting better with, with the, uh, actually through the last part of this year, uh, it's actually now gone to over 20 pesos to the dollar. Uh, and that's the first time I've ever seen that, um, as long as I can remember, well, well, since I started coming down here for the, uh, for the podcast, uh, and that's been almost nine years now. So Today, it's at 20.34 pesos to the dollar. Maybe it's time to buy a house, right? Uh, And speaking of that, and uh, what it's like to be living in Vallarta, I've had a couple people ask me how that's going, and it's kind of weird. It's a little strange, but... You know, when, when we used to visit, you know, a couple times a year, the conversations with the Uber drivers and the taxis were a lot different than they are today. I mean, you know, they used to ask questions like, where do you live? And, uh, you know, are you on vacation? But but now I kind of feel like I need to apologize for living here because, you know, I mean, just, I don't know, maybe even tell a fib or something like that and say that I live in Los Angeles. I don't know. Uh, it's, maybe it's just me being overly sensitive, you know, about, uh, you know, we hear about the struggles every day of, uh, of the people living here, the Patisaladas who are just trying to make ends meet, you know, and, you know, paying higher rents just because guys like me are moving in. So I, anyway, I don't know if I'm imagining it or, you know, if I just see there's a little bit of resentment coming from the drivers or just if I'm overreacting, I don't know. But uh, my wife kind of thinks I'm overacting, so I hope so. We'll see. Anyway, uh, I'm going to be talking a little bit more about our move when uh, I can <laughs> in just a couple of weeks. I can't really say much just about yet. And... um I have more to tell you about what's happening in our neighborhood where we live, where we live just now, uh, in El Cerro. Uh, that's the neighborhood that's above Gringo Gulch. But before that, I have our friend Edgar Rivas. We're going to have him talk about what's happening this weekend, today, and tomorrow, the 16th and 17th of November at Parque Hidalgo. Uh, Edgar's having one of his great events. It's a craft beer festival over in Parque Hidalgo. It's the Brewmasters Festival in Puerto Vallarta. So take it away, Edgar. Edgar Rivas, thanks for coming on the show again. My friend Barry, what a pleasure to see you here in Vallarta once again. It's always it's always lovely, my friend. Uh, all right, now the, the season's starting up, high season's starting up, and that means... It's time for some of your incredible festivals that you put on. So what's the first one? What's happening this year? It is, my friend. Uh, we start the season 
uh, 24-25, and we're going to start it actually this weekend with the Brewmaster Festival. It is the seventh edition of the Craft Beer Festival from Puerto Vallarta. I'm very happy because, I mean, uh, we started this project in 2017 in the Kuale Island, and then we grow it, we grow it, and then we're in Parque Hidalgo. Actually, last year it was also in Parque Hidalgo. We're once again repeating the location because it's the perfect uh, the perfect place. We are right in the beginning of the Malecon or the end, depends where you start to walk. <laughs> but I mean, it's 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 a good location because we have hotels around. It will be a long weekend in in Mexico because it's the the twentieth of the no, of November is the Revolution Day. Uh-huh. It is the anniversary of the Revolution. So this Monday, the the eighteenth. It's uh, it's like day off in all Mexico, so will be lots of Mexican tourists coming, and for sure now all the all the people, the I mean Americans, Canadians are here in Vallarta for the winter. Yeah, are, they're are, they're starting to come. Aren't they, they are starting to come, so it's amazing. So it will be uh, the perfect time, and well, uh, I'm excited because we're bringing people from Guadalajara. Uh, craft beer is growing very very fast in Mexico. And of course, Guadalajara is one of the uh, biggest uh, exposures uh, of the cities where it's growing this movement. So we're bringing people from Guadalajara. Uh, we're having like Zorra, one of the most the most important breweries from Guadalajara. We're having Barrio Chico. Some of the people they know Barrio Chico. They have a craft beer with CBD. It's very good one. Oh, cool. uh, we're having Pagan also from Guadalajara. It's the first time they come. Pagan, it's a new one. Huesuda, uh, the second time they came, they come to Puerto Vallarta. Uh, we're having also Tres Californias. This guy is a, is a guy who, who, who sells all the best craft beer from the Baja in Guadalajara. So he will come also with us to share more of the, the beer culture from Baja California, which is also, uh, actually Baja California is the biggest place in Mexico for uh, craft beer. Wow. The most important breweries and the most award breweries are in Baja, and the biggest craft beer festivals are actually in Baja. So we're, we're going to have also beer from the Baja. Uh, uh, also, what, Vallarta. We, we, can lose, we can forget about Vallarta. We're having Playa Grande. Playa Grande is actually a, like an area. There's a river. It's, it's behind uh, Pitillal, for those who doesn't know where is Playa Grande. Because these two young guys, it's two brothers, a girl and a boy. These guys, they, they are the brewmasters. They started this project three years ago. And now uh, they are going to launch the, the brand okay. on the festival. So Playa Grande is the name of the, the beer. You should try it. They're going to have like four different styles. Pilsner, IPA, Stout, Red Ale. A red Ale is not very popular, let's say. So they're going to have like a Red Ale. Uh, I'll mm-hmm. totally encourage you to try it. So that's that's amazing because it's uh, it is two young brothers working on this local project and now ready to launch the the brand yeah. in the Brewmaster Festival. So it will be oh that'd be great, yeah. awesome to have these guys. Of course, from Nayarit Bucerías, we have Buclas. It's pretty much the best brewery in the Bay. About talking about the quality, the consistency. So we're having Buclas. They have a new a new brewmaster or head brewer, as they also call it. It's a guy from San Luis Potosí. He's been working in different cities of Mexico, uh, and and he's been in the one of the best breweries. So lots of new things to try about Buclas. I mean, the the same recipes they already have, but now with a new twist. And uh, this new twist is more flavor, more quality in the ingredients. I was talking with Memo, the head brewer, uh, a week ago, and actually one of the greatest news. Let me guys tell you, we're going to have a special beer this year. Is the first time we're going to have our own our own beer, the Brewmaster really? beer. Really? And it's actually in collaboration with Buclas. So what we're going to have, get ready, because I know you guys are having fun in the sun and now it's the perfect weather in Vallarta. We're going to have a Cream El Guanabana. Ooh. Light, refreshing, with lots of body, like, you know, like, and the Cream El, that's what you, the cream, so it gives you like a uh, like a creamy texture in your palate, plus the bubbles, refreshing light bubbles, and the aftertaste, the guanabana, the tropical flavors. <laughs> oh, that guys, great. guys, you have to be there. You have to try it. Uh, this is one of the, the the news we have for this year. The, this collaboration with Buclas. Uh, I mean, every try every year trying to improve the project, 
um, the people who's visiting us also from San Luis Potosí, La Herejía. It is actually the third time they come from San Luis Potosí. They love the project. They right. love the festival, the people. Uh, they have also the regular clients now. So La Herejía is coming from San Luis Potosí. Uh, which is, I mean, I, I love to have people from other cities of Mexico because this is the thing, not to to promote, to share the culture about the craft beer. Uh, uh, well, uh, uh, the the tourists, American, Canadians, people from Europe. I, I I know you guys are more used to these flavors and about this this culture, no? In Mexico, in Puerto Vallarta, pues, well, you guys know there's just a few breweries in town. It's growing. It's growing. But uh, this is part of the goals of the of the festival, not to with the locals. I'm talking about the local people um, to share with them. Hey, try it! This is the flavor of a nice lager, of a nice IPA stout. And then you know, break the ice and say, okay, okay, I like, I, I think I like stouts, no? Oh, I think I like this one. So you know, like uh, try something new. Introduce him to the local. Uh communities right totally and not even when we have a local brewery and uh, people from other cities like oh, okay then i try then it, it opens the spectrum no then yeah. say, oh, okay that's the flavor from baja from guadalajara from vallarta no so it's a it's a quite interesting no this this thing like to share no because the a festival is it is this big celebration you put all things together in this case craft beer and it is for a Everybody is welcome. Of course, the entrance, the access is free. Uh, you don't have to pay. And of course, the vendors, they always give you like a small free sample. So, you know, it, it, yeah. it helps, no? Exactly. Makes so it more friendly. There'll be food too, I imagine. Sure. We're yeah. having food together with the, how I say, along with the beer. Yeah. We need some food, of course. We need to, to put something in our tummies. So, of course, we're having seafood. We're having ceviche, aguachile, um, grilled shrimps. Uh, we're going to have also, we're having tacos, famous tacos al pastor, of course. Of course. Can never fail with tacos al pastor. But uh, we have another vendor, uh, Meat on Grill, Vallarta, that's the name of the these guys. Uh, these guys, they have like arrachera, bon marrow, different sausages, uh, Mexican sausages, Italian sausages, pancetta, um, different, different steaks, you know, all on the grill with organic tortilla, blue corn tortilla. So it's like more Mexico City style. You should try it. It's very, very good with provolone cheese. Oh, it's amazing. Uh, we're having also grill. We're having American grill. We're having, uh, we're going to have ribs. We're going to have pulled pork. Uh, we're going to have uh, uh, chili, nachos with chili. See, mm -hmm. Porquillo Smokehouse is coming to the festival for oh, those wow. who are waiting for Porquillo. Porquillo is now... A, Changing the location, Porquillo Smokehouse is changing the location, so now they are closed for the moment. But you should come to the festival. They will be this weekend, Saturday and Sunday, with us, sharing the nacho with nacho with chilies, pulled pork tortas, uh, baby back ribs. I was uh, talking with the yeah. guys yesterday about the menu. We're having also La Patagonia. That's an Argentinian grill, choripanes, empanadas. Very good. We're having also cenizas. Ashes, that's the name of the restaurant in Versailles. That's also American Grill, the, uh, barbecue ribs. Uh, uh, what else are you going to have? Like chicken, grilled chicken too. So lots of grill, tacos, seafood. Uh, what else are we going to have? Dessert. We can we can forget about dessert. We're having ice cream. We're having papas, like uh, fries, you know, like chips. Uh -huh, chips. Uh -huh. <laughs> chips. Uh, water for those who well we need water no like fresh oh, yeah. fresh water also will be part of the different things we're gonna have um, well other one of the other great greatest things we have in the festival is the collaboration with Octembul this is a, a festival from uh, Quebec it's a Quebecois friend uh, an Octembul festival it happens every year in August in the in the city of uh, what is it Mascouche Mascouche is a small city outside of Montreal, like 30 minutes north from Montreal. Uh -huh. So my friend, Claude Mers, who's the director and organizer of Octembul Festival, he, he comes every year. We set up a, a canopy, a table for him, and he's going to bring all the different artisanal spirits from Quebec. Uh -huh. So we're going to have gin, rum, vodka, uh, different artisanal liqueurs like amaretos, you know, those kind of herbal because we're having also whiskeys, uh, many different spirits, 
artisanal from the region of Quebec. So this is also other thing that I always like to do. And as as I invite him, he invites me. I was with him last last August on their festival doing tequila cocktails and tasting because for those who for those who heard me in a in a previous interview, I'm also a certified mezcalero taster. So I was in Octemble Festival doing cocktails and, and tequila tastings. Nice, yeah. Sharing the culture, sharing the culture of the agave spirits. So we're gonna also for all the Quebecois friends are in the bay. So we're gonna so have you're also going international. International. There you go. Mexico. We need a brewery from the from the US for sure next time. But I mean it's part of the thing. So if if everybody who's gonna listen the interview and has a brewery in the US or has an interesting contact, let us know. Because we will be we'll be we'll be glad to collaborate with someone from the US to have a a brewery, you know, it says the extra, culture. Extra, why not? Why not? See, see, oh, that's amazing. Well, you're going to have a lot of food. You're going to have, obviously, you're going to have a lot of food as, you know, to go with all of that beer. Uh, and you're going to need some food with that beer. There's no doubt about it, right? There's no doubt about it. Um, see, in the meantime, a little bit of music for sure. Uh, different musicians we're going to have. Uh, we're going to have even like DJ with disco music, uh, folkloric Mexican music. Um, tropical music mostly, you know, it's part of the vibe, right? Nice weather, sunny day, weekend, so you know, Mexican style. Uh, so with music for for all the people to enjoy. Uh, and bueno, I was forgetting also uh, the agave spirits, very important, oh, of course, part of the festival. Uh, we also like to invite uh, agave, pro, uh, bueno, raicilleros y tequileros, so we mezcaleros. So in this case, we're gonna have the three different agave spirits. We're going to have three bars with one with mezcal, uh, one with tequila, and one with raicilla. Nice. Actually, two with raicilla, mezcal, and tequila. So also, for those who like to try something new about raicilla, which is the local mezcal from Puerto Vallarta and the region, it's a good opportunity for you to try something new. Uh, you know, as I say, break the ice. <laughs> try right. it, try it. Absolutely. Now, Exacto. all of your... now. Uh, tell us what again the, the dates of the festival. The dates of the festival is this Saturday, the 16th, and Sunday, the 17th of November, right on the Parque Hidalgo in the in Zona Centro, see, ¿sí? close to the Hotel Rosita. And we're going to start at 1 p.m., from 1 p.m. to 11 p.m. So we're going to be pretty much all the evening, night in the park. Will be free access. You just pay whatever you want to drink, you want to eat. Uh, and we're going to have also uh, canopies, you know, with tables and chairs for the uh, food area. You can have a seat, you can enjoy the music, uh, buy another beer, you know. Right, S right. Stay around during the evening. Very good. Nice. Very, okay. And now, remember uh, that, uh, Edgar, you'll, you'll tell us about some of these other, other events that are coming up. But for all of his events, they are all similar in that there's food, there's great food, there's great music. Uh, there is, uh, there's, you know, lots to do and you know, any of your events are, are, in, they're, they're amazing. They're, they're fantastic. It's the formula. I guess it's like the formula to have a uh, good food, drinks. If it, in this case is the, the beer festival. So that's where we focus on the craft beer. Uh, of course, with the food, uh, the other, the next festival is coming is in January. And that's other of the festivals that I organized, the Ceviche and Aguachile Festival which is twice a year. So the next edition will be the Sunday, the 26th of January. That will be actually the, the 17th edition. And where it is the 10th anniversary. I started this project, the Ceviche and Aguachile Festival. I started in 2015. Uh -huh. So now it's, all, it's already 10 years working on, on this festival. It's been growing. I'm super happy because... 2025 will for me is like a dec a decade organizing events in Puerto Vallarta. So yeah, <laughs> will be big celebrations. So get ready, guys, because all the festivals are coming. Are gonna be like huge parties and always promoting, bringing new people. Uh, you know, it's all for Vallarta and the people who lives here, and or for all the tourists are always depending of the season. No? Yeah, very very good. Well, uh, obviously we're gonna be here like. We're living here now, so exactly. I will be visiting with you more often. You'll be letting us know uh, as events come up. And uh, don't forget, everybody, November 16th and 17th from 1 o'clock until 11 o'clock over at Parque Hidalgo, which is right 
in you know beautiful downtown Puerto Vallarta, right near the Rosita Hotel, and uh, tons to do. And thank you so much for coming and and talking again with uh, with our listeners and letting them know what's going on here. Thank you, Barry. Thank you, friends. Uh, I hope to see you in the festivals. Uh, for more information, you can look for us in social media as Brewmaster Festivals, uh, Instagram, Facebook. You can see all the information. The different breweries are coming. So stay around, stay tuned, and see you to have some craft beers this weekend. Excellent. Thanks again. Thank you, guys. All righty. Thank you so much, Edgar. Uh, now, I want to clarify uh, something that Edgar said when he was talking about that brewery up in Playa Grande, uh, above Pitial. Uh, now, Edgar referred to the brewers as brothers, but actually, um, and he also did, he said a brother and sister. So they are a brother and sister team, just so that you know. You see, like in Spanish, uh, when you refer to your children, it's hijos, even though there are hijas, you know girls. So, uh, you know, that might have caused some of the confusion, just to let you know. Anyway, get thee over to Parque Hidalgo this weekend, today and tomorrow, and uh, eat. Uh, drink lots of beer and be merry. So, uh, check out the links in the show note, www.portobattotravelshow.com. Uh, speaking of beer and eating, uh, Debbie and I found a really nice place, a cool place, uh, for beer and ceviche. And uh, the place is called A Thousand Kawamas. Uh, they sell those big bottles of liter plus size beers. Uh, they are known as Kawamas. The Kawama is named after a lugger haired turtle. That's kind of the shape that they have, I guess, and the bottle does. And uh, up at. Uh, a thousand Kawamas, they have 18 different, uh, mostly Mexican beers on their menu. Uh, and it's on the roof. It's on the roof of the three story building in Cinco de Diciembre. It's got no elevator. So sorry about that. Uh, it's next door to a Lay's grocery store. You know, it's on the corner of Uruguay and Avenida Mexico. And, uh, if you like aqua chili, it is delicious. Uh, they've got it in three different sizes, uh, all different kinds, all different heats, different kinds of flavorings. It's really, really nice. Uh, they've got a uh, a shrimp salad stuffed avocado that's really tasty, uh, very reasonably priced as well. Uh, it's a very chill spot. It's a nice place to hang out and watch the bustling town below. Uh, with uh, with a peekaboo view of the bay and uh, nice music as well. It's a younger crowd, I gotta say. So um, I guess that has something to do with the uh, the three floor climb thingy. So uh, don't don't get too effed up. Uh, you don't want to fall down those stairs or even up those stairs. It's not good. Uh, and speaking of stairs, uh, we actually live in a place like right now where we're where we're staying at this Airbnb. With lots of stairs. It's like 200 stairs from sea level to our street. And then about 50 or more to our front door. Now, we've been getting a lot of stair stepping in for sure. And we uh, we actually live off of Emiliano Carranza, right near Iterbide. It's one of those streets that uh, people take to get up to the, the cross. And so we see a lot of healthy looking people walking uh, up there uh, in the mornings up our street. Uh, and uh, we call them crosswalkers. It's... Anyway, uh, we always take the stairs down. It's just that 200 stairs up thingy that uh, has us taking a taxi uh, at least once a day, sometimes twice a day. And anyway, over the last couple of days, when we would take the taxi home uh, from having dinner, we noticed a neighborhood project was taking place. Uh, on our street, on either side of this narrow street, they had uh, some of these these long plastic tables uh, set up, um, and they were like making these what looked like some headdresses of some sort. They had a little uh, assembly line going on there, 
and I uh, was kind of interested in what was going on. So uh, the next morning, I walked down to their there's a little tea end of there uh, where they had those tables set up the night before, and uh, it's an Aberotis store. Uh, now, Aberotis uh, f- translates to groceries, by the way. And anyway, um, I asked this nice little lady at the Aberotis uh, what they were making, and uh, she said they were making panachos for the upcoming processions that are coming up uh, December 1st through the 12th. And she explained that uh, every barrio in Vallarta has a chance to participate in this uh, religious ceremonies that they have, these processions in honor of Our Lady de Guadalupe. So I said, Panachos, what's what's a Panacho? So anyway, I whipped out my trusty cell phone and I did the Google A thing and I discovered a very interesting subject that I'll share with you right now before we get to Frankie and Jimmy over at Bayarda Cares. The panacho that they're referring to is a unique feathered headdress, uh, the panacho de Moctezuma. And uh, the panacho has a storied past and a a very controversial present right now. Uh, It was given to Hernan Cortez along with uh, dozens of other artifacts as a gift by Moctezuma II. And Cortez, as a thank you, uh, held him hostage and forced him to govern from his palace. Uh, That's actually another rabbit hole we need to take you into one day, but I do digress. Let's go back to the Panacho. So anyway, this Panacho uh, eventually ended up in Austria. And here's the story. Well, part of the story. Anyway, it's from uh, Yucatan Magazine. Uh, it says, Mexico, Mexico demands the return of the crown of Aztec Emperor Moctezuma II. This was written by Carlos Rosado van der Gracht. Great name. Uh, February 11th, 2022, Mexican President Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador has called for Austria to repatriate the artifact known as El Panacho de Moctezuma. Uh, El Panacho de Moctezuma, or Montezuma's headdress, is a featherwork crown that tradition holds belonged to Moctezuma II and the Aztec emperor at the time of the uh, Spanish conquest. The headdress itself is made from green quetzal feathers and is sewn with gold detailing. In the 16th century, the famous headdress was taken to Europe as a war trophy of sorts and has resided in Vienna's Museum of Ethnography uh, since early 19th century. The fact that the relic is still abroad remains a contentious issue. The Austrians have the Panacho illegally, and what's worse, they've not even wanted to loan it to us for temporary display. This is extremely unjust and selfish, said President Lopez Obrador during one of his early morning press conferences earlier this week. Uh, Given the cultural and historical significance of this artifact, several Mexican governments have attempted to recover this feathered crown, but have ultimately been turned down. The Austrian government has cited the difficulty of moving the famous address without damaging it as one of the reasons behind their refusal to return it to Mexico. Uh, But several Austrian lawmakers now argue that it's about time for the country to return the relic, as the technology surely does exist, to do so safely. This news has been welcomed by the Mexican government, uh, though no plans for the repatriation of the artifact have been announced. The Lopez Obrador government said that during its tenure, over 6,000 pre-Columbian archaeological artifacts have already been returned to Mexico. Uh, The diplomatic skirmish between Mexico and Austria comes at a time when controversy continues to grow around the auction of pre-Hispanic artifacts abroad. Uh, Several of the pieces up for auction later this week in Paris are expected to reach prices in the tens of thousands of euros. So, very interesting. The Panacho is beautiful. Uh, I have a link to that article from the Yucatan magazine in the show notes. You can find it at www.portdevantatravelshow.com. So, what do you think? 
Uh, you think they'll they'll ever return the Panacho to Mexico? I mean, you know, with all the technology, they're right. They should be able to do this. But uh, I don't think they'll ever do it. Anyway, we'll see. It will be nice if they did. Uh, and what? And by the way, what does the Panacho de Moctezuma have to do with the processions uh, celebrating the Virgin of Guadalupe? Well, I'll tell you what. We'll find out next week. I'll let you know. Uh, let's get to Jimmy and Frankie at Fayart Cares. If you have followed the Puerto Vallarta Travel Show for any length of time, then you will know these two friends of mine. We first visited Jimmy and Frankie at their restaurant uh, years back over in Lopez Mateos. It was called the Tunnel Road Barbecue, if you'll remember. Uh, and then when COVID hit, they went to work helping feed the hungry and the desperate uh, Viartensis uh, by creating the Viarta Food Bank. Uh, and uh, we've been to the Viarta Food Bank a couple of times to catch up uh, on what they're doing there and to watch them grow and more. And now uh, they have a new name. It's Viarta Cares. So let's go right now to Calle Rio Lerma in Colonia Lopez Moteos. Uh, let's have a chat with our friends Frankie Victoria and Jimmy Pluff with Viarta Cares. In Puerto Vallarta, Mexico. Jimmy and Frankie, thanks for coming on the show again. Hey, I don't know. Maybe you've got a record here. You're pretty close anyway. We've been on a few times. Yeah, thanks for coming on. Thank you for having yeah, us. Thanks for having us. Uh, now, the last time we visited, uh, it was Vallarta Food Bank. And now it is Vallarta Cares. Um, is there a... It's, now, what's the reason for that? What was the reason for that? There's a couple of reasons. Uh, the The main reason was we didn't feel like we're you know it encompassed what we do. We're not just a food bank. We do a lot of different things. We have a clinic. We have a dentist. We have disaster relief, disaster, disaster relief, prevention. and, and uh, kind of a, a little civil protection wing. And we we do lots of different things. We have a shower. We have food classes. We have classes. We have. Uh, a little store around the corner. We have all kinds of stuff going on. So the food bank just didn't cover enough. Right. So. And people were asking questions like, well, why does a food bank need a chainsaw? <laughs> and so, Especially for when writing grants, we would get that question a lot. Oh, uh, okay. Really? So, yeah. Right. So writing there's... grants, we'd get asked, you know, well, what are you guys asking for a chainsaw and a generator for? Oh, yeah. All right, you know that makes that makes total sense to me. Um, all right, so uh, so Viarta cares. Um, tell us about what's going on right now at uh, at Viarta cares. Well, Viarta cares mainly has three branches, which is the food, where we have the soup kitchen and the store, and uh, the water now as well as part of this program. We also have the health part, which is the clinics. Uh, with a doctor and a dental clinic. And we have the disaster prevention, uh, which we are now trying to create brigades in each of the furthest towns of the municipalities and equipping them uh, with training and obviously equipment in order for them to respond to emergencies before like the ambulance can get to them or the firefighters can get to them because that can take hours. Yeah. And so right now we're just surviving <laughs> the in, the intent is though is to equip some of these far-flung places like you've been to mato right oh yeah well you realize it takes an ambulance from tuito an hour to get there if it's sitting in tuito when they need it and then an hour to get back and that might not be where they need to go they might need to come all the way to puerto vallarta so that's two hours well yeah. i'm sure you've heard of the golden hour in which if actions are taken, lives can be saved. I mean, they've had motorcycle accidents down there in Mato and nobody knew CPR. So somebody passed away. Right, uh, nobody right. knew how to bandage or nor did they have the equipment to bandage a, a heavy bleed. So we're trying to bring some education down there as far as first responder stuff. And, you know, those who can can purchase some equipment. Or, you know, pool money and buy some equipment. And then we're hoping to get some money together ourselves or write a grant and 
get some equipment for them so that they are equipped and ready. And then should a disaster happen, they're able to respond before anybody else has even thought about them. They're able to handle their own stuff in house to an extent, you know, they're not going to do everything, but you know, if you can do CPR till the ambulance gets there, that'd keep somebody alive. Right. Right. So, um, these teams, how, how big are they? Uh, in Mato currently we have 28 volunteers. Uh, and we're hoping that that was kind of our pilot program. So that was our test batch. Right. And that has done really well. So what we're looking to do is expand that into other areas. The goal is to have 10 across the bay. Okay. And then these people are um, not necessarily, uh, medics or have medical backgrounds. They just are being just trained. Regular right? everyday to, guy. Really? Okay. Just here we go. You're part of the, yep. the volunteer Brigade. Like, the, like the volunteer firefighters, right? And stuff like After that. After a fashion, yeah. yeah. I mean, you might have some people that have more of a knack for the medical side of things, and some people are just really good with a shovel. All right. those things are useful. just depends on the situation. Right. Some people can't stand the sight of blood. Maybe they don't want to be on that team. Well, <laughs> that's that doesn't have to be their job. You know, okay. we just hold the trainings for different things. Like uh, we did one not that long ago, Contra Incendios. So, like, uh, you know basic fire Firefighter. fighting and fire prevention don't store your you know can of gasoline and oily rags next to the stove don't put the you know the gas can right next to something that uh sparks a lot yeah just basic stuff and then some of it's um you know what to do if this or that happens which is a common occurrence across mexico you know the gas tank's got a leak got a fire what do you do well let's turn the valve off first Start there. Uh, there we go. Good. You yeah. know, get a get a wet rag and go turn it off. And and so just some of this basic stuff, it hasn't occurred to people to do some of it or uh, it's just not something that came up. Right. So there, th th these people are trained to basically teach, right? Teach people. Teach. You know. and, and that gets out in the community through like they'll tell their kids, they'll tell their, yeah. you know, go <laughs> home, tell their wife, you know. Or the wife will go home, tell the husband, and they'll look in, you know, they start looking around their house. They go, maybe we should move those oily rags outside. Yeah, yeah. Sweetie, right. let's <laughs> let's put those out in the shed, you know. And right. so that kind of stuff, and then the, the first aid stuff, and then uh, basically having groups of people that should another hurricane or flood or disaster happen, we call on those same people to help in their community. Say, hey, man, we, we need some help with this tree. Uh, I got 28 people sitting right there ready to go, and they, they're willing to help. Well, well, we already okay. know they've, they've offered to help, and so we're trying to enhance that ability in any way we can. That's and amazing. So That will make those communities more resilient should something happen, and that's the ultimate goal is to make them a little more self-reliant in-house. Gotcha. Wow, wow. Uh, so these, uh, well... All right, so you've got you're going to have those all around the bay. Uh, you said? That's the goal. That's the goal. We we don't currently have the funding to you know, go and train. Yeah, that was my all next. These that was my next question. Is like, how are you going to fund all this stuff? Money's tight. Yeah. So that that was a pilot program that we did a couple of months ago, and we want to follow it up. But at current, our our funds just aren't where they need to be. Right. So. Right. All right. Let's let's talk. Um, before we get into other programs, cause I, you know, I went down, I saw your clinic is beautiful. I mean, it's amazing. Thank You've you. got a, a great, uh, the, the whole, everything like the water purification thing you've got going out here. And of course the meals, uh, now, um, before we get into the funding thing, let's talk about them. Let's talk about the meals. Uh, what are, uh, I mean, what, what days of the week are you doing this? I know you were doing this daily or you're not doing this daily any longer, are you? No, we are down to three days a week to conserve what funds we do have. Okay. Yes, um, because of, it's low season, and every year we do go through a big dip in donations. We usually have to close down during summertime for three days a week instead of serving five days a week, which ultimately hurts the people that we're serving, obviously. Uh, but it's what we have to do in order to survive, in order to be here with them. So right now we're only serving um, Monday, Wednesday, and Saturday for them. Hopefully our, our donations are going to go back up and we'll be able to open five days a week soon. 
Okay, good. The big the big magic is the monthly donations because that's what we really look at and go, okay, can we be, you know, we know we're Those getting this much every you're month. depending on that, yeah. And, well, we look at that and we determine based off that what we can or can't do. And because it's now dropped beyond uh, below a certain threshold, we're in survival mode. And ultimately it's going to scale back until either the door shuts or until it comes, you know, bounces back, goes the other way. Right. And I'm, I'm optimistic that it will go back the other way and, uh, we'll get some more monthly donors coming in. But I think a lot of people think, well, COVID's over and it's not so bad. High season tours coming back. You got to realize Puerto Vallarta is now one of the most expensive places in Latin America to go on vacation. Yeah. Yeah. To people, live. And to live and people are flying to Italy cheaper and staying there for the, you know, the winter months. So we kind of look at that and, and we're, we're a little worried because we're wondering if as much tourism as we've had in the past is going to occur. Right, right. And that generates money and that follows with donations and the seasonal tourists. And, and of course the help that comes with the seasonal tourists too, the right? Volunteers, Cause the volunteers, yeah. right? Cause I mean, we, the, the volunteers that are here through the summer, are some of our biggest diehards. Oh, they gotta be. Yeah. Yeah. Cause they're, they're here when it's, freaking hot oh number one miserable and uh they're kind of like um they're the only game in town you know there's no, well they, they no are relief so is we, there you know i feel like we've been whipping a beat horse you know i feel bad but <laughs> it's it, it is what it is i mean that's that's who's here and i i love them for it and bless their heart because we couldn't do any of what we do without some of those people all right. Well, uh, let's talk a little bit about how people, um, you know, can do one of these uh, monthly donations. But how, how do how do we go about doing that? Well, we have several ways. Uh, you can donate through our website, in which you can donate in pesos or in dollars. Uh, we're about to launch a new uh, donation platform with a with some partners in the U.S. called My Change, in which you can sign up your credit card, and from your expenses, it will automatically donate the remaining balance until the next dollar, you know, the roundup. The roundup thing, yeah. So it's a very small uh, amount that you get, that you donate, that you basically don't feel it, you right, know. But right. if we have 100 people do it like that, then we can obviously do a lot more. We can. We've kind of done a, a it's test. interesting, yeah. We've kind of done a test round of that, and it's it's generated a significant amount. Yeah. So wow. we'd like to, you know, send go full send with it and and see how it works. We had some kinks to get ironed out with some of the software and some of the banking stuff, and so now that we've got that figured out, we're going to go full send. How interesting is that? All right, well, very good. I'll have a link to that particular. Um, well, to what is it called again? My change. My change. All I right. Yeah, I get link. it. Okay, send me the link. I'll have it in the in the show notes. Uh, so make sure you're looking for that. Um, and how, what other ways? Ah, and you can donate, uh, through our website directly. Uh, we now have it able that you can like create your own account because a lot of people were looking to change their, change their, uh, cards or something. And it was not oh, yeah, an then easy it would fall thing, off, you know? right? Because, uh, they're, they're, then they have an expired card or whatever it is that, that made it very hard to, to keep it, going, right? Exactly. And we didn't have that capability, but we just changed our website in order for you to be able to do that and to see your donation history. So it's a lot more transparent, I feel, so that you know exactly how much money you've donated. If by any way, because it happened last month where we were not sending the, the receipts uh, automatically like it should. So should you be missing one of your receipts, you just send us a message and we can send it back to you. And we have a lot like a better perspective of where donors really are. Uh huh. Very good. Mm -hmm. Very good. We didn't. We we didn't have all that information before, so we couldn't interact like we felt like we should be able to with our donors. And and everybody's valuable from you know one peso, one dollar, all the way to the top end. It all helps us move forward. It all puts food on plates. So at the end of the day, everybody's important. Yeah. Um. There is several donation barrels located across downtown now, and I'm looking for a home for one more, if you know anybody. And uh, those have a uh, a little kind of a, a little thing like that like thing a QR sitting code? in the corner. They've got a QR code so you can donate. You just scan that with your phone. 
you can go to the website. There's more information on there as far as to how to do it. And it's on all these donation barrels, but those donation barrels are for non-perishable foods, clothing, any sort of thing. And our little car goes out and, and makes around and picks them up when they call us and tell us they're full. Yeah, all right. Yeah, I saw one, I think, over uh, at Sergio Costa's place, over at uh, mm-hmm. the uh, Gusto Lounge. Gusto Lounge. Yep, he's got one. Uh, Davino Dante has one. And then... Caroline Callis in Versailles has one as well her uh handmade clothing store over in versailles very nice very nice all right well very cool um so yeah if anybody knows uh who wants to uh well no ask around if you got a restaurant or someplace that's you know a little little more high uh visibility so uh, we can get some more uh donations coming into viarta care well and if they don't want to host a whole barrel we've got these little kind of uh acrylic boxes that we can do as well. So okay. some people just want something small and out of the way, and and it's got the same information on it, but they just want somewhere to chuck coins and stuff, and that's fine. But we've got the barrels uh, for the for the non perishable goods. Well, for the big stuff, you yeah. know, and and collection points to have it closer because a lot of people don't have cars or they don't want to come over here and and drop stuff off or they don't know when we're here when we're not here. Right. Right. So. The, that was to make it easier to find a collection point to drop stuff off. And if you're donating cash, you're welcome to do it at those places as well. Oh, I right. just wouldn't drop that in the barrel, probably <laughs> give it to the <laughs> proprietor and tell them this is for the barrel when they come to pick it up. You know, <laughs> That's a great idea. All right. Well, very good. We'll look for those around town. And uh, that's, the, um, well, you know. That's another another way, right? Another way. Yes. And finally, like the last one that we have is donating via PayPal. We are one of PayPal's charities. So you can look for our name in Spanish, our legal name. It's Alacena por Amor a Vallarta. And you can get it or our link is also on, on our website and our Facebook page. Okay, good. We'll have all, all the links to all those in the show notes too. So you can uh, you find there. Uh, again, if you uh, were a regular donor and you dropped off, uh, you might want to reconsider, um, you know, re-upping, see how that goes. We, we're really pushing the monthly the monthly donor program over one-time donations as, you know, we don't know if that one-time donation is coming every month. We're, we're not sure. Well, you know, the, the before, monthly... we couldn't see who it came from either, so we couldn't send you a thank you card. Oh, well, <laughs> well now you can. Yeah. Yes, so. but more than anything, like the monthly donations give us a better perspective. It helps us budget so that we know how much we can spend on food or how much we can spend on in case of an emergency or whatever. It helps us budget a lot better, Yeah. which before, again, we didn't have this visibility. But um, this year we are really trying to push forward because we want to be here for much longer than Jim and I are going to be alive. We do believe that we are not the owners of this um, as of this association. We're just taking care of it and we're setting setting it up for whoever comes and lead it afterwards. We really want to make sure that the bases are there so that this outlive us like, I don't know, a hundred years. There's always going to be people in need. And I do think that there's people with the heart of wanting to help those uh, like we do. Um, In reality, like everything that moves us and everything that we do is just to help others. Whether you saw like right now with the food, uh, you guys weren't there. But like afterwards, another association came because we don't only it doesn't just stay with us, the food. After it's been um, after we've collected, for example, all the things that we get from Carl's Jr., which is always lettuce, onion, tomatoes, we share with other associations. So we don't, we don't try to hoard things. What we get, for example, from, from Girls Junior, we use what we can here at the soup kitchen for obviously making our food for like, we give people a, a salad afterwards, but we also share with many associations. We have three rehab centers, two orphanages and four different soup kitchens that all this food goes to. Wow. Wow. So whenever you donate to us, you're not just donating to us. You're making sure that the kids and rice also have food, you know, at the end of the month. Because every association needs money. And we are all struggling, all of us, regardless of whatever uh, our mission is. Uh, we're always, like, struggling. So if we share between each other, we can amplify the impact that one single donation can make. 
In this case, Carl's Jr. is only donating to us. But we are making sure that nothing goes to waste and that more people get to eat. Yeah. Wow. It's just like uh, Rise collects from Costco. We can't. Uh, but when Rise collects, they, you know, they have a handful of kids there. I think they're at 30 now, 30 something, yeah. which is pretty high for them. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but, you know, generally they get you know, a truckload of, you know, strawberries or a truckload of potatoes or, I mean, Costco gives them a lot of stuff and they don't, A, have room to store it and B, they don't have a use for it all. Right. They, they can't, can't use it, it fast like enough. Yeah. And that we have the same issue sometimes. We can't use it all fast enough. We can give it away, but I'd much rather use it and spread it and make it go further. So like when we get strawberries, we freeze them and turn them into strawberry fresh, uh, fresh water. Mm -hmm. which is kind of cool and yeah. very popular in the hot months. I bet it is, yeah. Very like, popular. The main takeaway from this is that we really do want to work with others. We really do want to improve our community, and we can't do it alone. It has to be an effort of everybody that's a part of it, and we are doing what we can in like not wasting, uh, making sure that we don't waste the food, making sure that it goes to others, making sure that, for example, we got a donation of a, of a printer. We already have a printer, so we gave it to another association who's just starting and they didn't have one. Yeah, you know, yeah. it takes nothing from us to share with other people, but it's, but it's always, always hard for me when I hear, oh, the food bank cuts a lot of money. We don't. Right. We don't. We yeah. are struggling so much. Yeah. But we are very loud into saying, donate to us, donate to us, which other associations just don't have that uh, right. forum, you know? Yeah, exactly. Well, you've, um, you have you have a track record, okay? that's I think that's really important. I think that, uh, and, and then what you do here is amazing. If anybody were to, you know, if you're, you're on vacation, you want to come see what happens here, uh, come out to Lopez Mateo and see what's going on over here. I mean, it well, is uh, We'll amazing. happily show anybody around. We like to show off all our, all our cool stuff yeah. and what we do. We really love what we do. So it's not hard to get for us to get excited about it. And, you know, purified water might not seem like a big deal, but the price has gone way, way up since some folks were here last year. Yeah. Like people don't realize if you buy a, a, a Garafon off the CL truck, it's 40 something pesos. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But like the biggest thing that I, I like about that whole system that we got is that it's mobile. So, yeah, of course, it helps us a lot here. But if there is a hurricane, we can bring fresh drinking water and we don't bring the little bottles, the little plastic bottles, which contaminate a lot. Right. And which and is they end not up, enough. They end up people. everywhere. Exactly. And yeah. unused. They're single use plastic bottles when a lot of people we found after a hurricane have their Garafone still. They'll have the, the yeah. water jugs in the house. Right. So, so you instead of trucking, right you know, a truck bed full of bottles, which is at the end of the day, doesn't help that much. I can set up our, our water truck out there and provide clean water as long as I've got access to it. I mean, I, I was able to stick a hose down a well in Mato after the hurricane and pull water out of that thing 10 times a day, 3000 liters each load and distribute it around that area quickly. Amazing. I mean, 10 times in one day. I mean, we worked into the night that night, but they hadn't had water in over a week. Wow. So people were desperate. Yeah. yeah. Desperate. And it was hot, sweaty. There was no wind. It was just miserable. You know how good a shower feels? <laughs> yeah. You've been kind of marinating for six or seven days. Yeah. Everybody is, the people were going and washing the estuary, and there's crocodiles in there. Yeah. Yeah. It's a little dangerous. <laughs> so, oh, wow. Wow. Uh, but, no, it's it's a great system. We can take it on the road. We can do it wherever we need to do it, and we're very grateful for it. It's, um, uh, it's amazing. It's amazing. I've got pictures of it in the show notes, so you have to go take a look at those and see what it looks like. And it's amazing. Um, you know, I'm watching you fill garrafons of water right here. Um, and you know, I guess people come and bring theirs, and you just fill them up for them. Is that how you? Well, do that? we as part of that program, uh, that was by uh, via a grant from the state of Jalisco. And so we have a hundred and some change in that program, 200, 200 people in that program. 200 people. So we had 200 brand new Garafones that we, you know, interviewed people and saying, you know, how, how many Garafones a week you going through and would this help you? And we did it, you know, kind of another little mini interview to kind of find uh -huh. out if they would 
this would help them. Right. Because, you know, this 90-year-old woman lives around the corner, but she can't carry that 20-liter jug. Nope. So not very helpful to fill one up for her. <laughs> and uh, so we fill, I mean, I fill up the same one every every day sometimes for a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. And it's, a lot of people have said it's a big help and they think the water's delicious. We're 50 cent percent, 50 percent cleaner than seal water. Wow. Wow. Well, people do love the taste. Um, we had some lady that's like, she said, oh, I love this water because it's, it tastes sweet. And I'm like, how does it taste sweet? I taste it normal. She was like, no, this is the most delicious water. Well, there you go. It tastes, yeah. like, it tastes like water to me, but it, it does taste cleaner than, you know, a lot of the, lot of the uh, chlorinated stuff that you get, you know, because they're, you know, I don't know how long it's going to sit in that jug yeah. at the OXO. So it's generally heavier chlorinated. I don't like the taste of it. Oh, yeah. No, and you can sometimes if it sits in the plastic a long time. That's what you get, too. Uh, and you don't know how long it's been right. sitting in the sun in the plastic. Yeah, that, that, that can be. Easy. That's that's yeah. where things get a little bit Frankie nasty. Frankie calls it cancer water. Yeah, you know, I I, I can taste it. Um, but you, you taste but, the cancer? No, I could just feel it coming coming down. You know, oh, I'm drinking you that go. stuff. I can taste it. Oh no, no, Barry, don't 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 drink that. Pour that out. Um, but um, it's amazing though. This machine uh, washes the garrafon out. It rinses it out and then fills it up. And well, with uh, someone else's help, but it's amazing how that all works out. And you have that shower um, still that is uh, available to whoever needs a shower, right? Yep, it's open from uh, 9 a.m. to noon mm -hmm. every day. And we generally see between eight and 10 customers a day. Uh -huh. I say customers, and <laughs> eight, eight to 10 people a day would like a shower. It's also got uh, hot water. Yeah. Yeah. Which is in the winter months, people wouldn't come take a shower because water ice cold. Ice cold a bit, yeah. So now in the you know when the, they tell us the water's too cold and they're not wanting to come and shower, we'll go open up the little gas valve and turn on the water heater. Well, wow. wow, that's amazing. It's right. got a nice tankless water heater, and the garden club paid to brick that thing up and put in a drain, and uh, we tiled it and we made it big enough so that they can use it as a kind of a changing room on one side and on the other side it's the the shower, but we provide them with. Uh, soap and shampoo and um in some cases a little razor uh there's uh, towels. fresh towels out there some very nice towels and we keep those clean and rolled up out there so that they've got everything they need and if we can we'll supply them with an extra set of clothes if they need it right wow if we have stuff that fits them you know not everybody i've seen some oddball stuff you know that like mr juan has size 14 feet Wow, yeah. They don't sell size 14 shoes anywhere I've ever been here. So I we, we usually ask people on Facebook, could anybody got a size 14 shoe? Because one blows through them. <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, what other programs? Anything uh, else that you um, that you have um, well, that we haven't heard about? We have classes. Uh, right now we have our English classes. Okay. It's on Wednesday. Uh, we have a couple of volunteers who have been amazing at, at teaching this class and people love it. We have a couple of adults and more, more than anything like teenage kids. We also have empowering classes for women. Um, these classes are very important because it, it helps them regain their value of self and it helps them identify uh, violence, different types of violence, and what to do in in that case. Like in Mexico, it's very prevalent the machismo and the the violence against women. Uh, you can see every day somebody has been killed, somebody has been like taken. So we really are trying to help to teach them that this is a safe environment, uh, that this is a place where they can come get help. And it has happened um, a couple of times. We've had women come like in the morning or so and they are beaten up so mm. we have to call the lawyer because we we thankfully have a lawyer who works with us and she helps us do what we call in Mexico acompañamiento legal which is basically like they go with her to do all the steps that she has to do in order to uh, get out of that it includes obviously legal advice going with her to the fiscalia to do all the police reporting things that she has to do which can be very intimidating. I mean, no if you, you go into the fiscalia, they're not nice people in there. 
if you've ever been, I mean, they're like, well, what were you doing over there? Why did you do it? What were you wearing? Did you provoke him? Did you say something? Well, I don't know. That outfit sounds provocative. And I mean, it's the, the stuff that you hear is wild. Well, that's out of control, eh? Yeah. So, and, and in this also includes a little bit of, um, not as much as we would like, but a little bit of um, psychological help as well to deal with that event. Yeah. Uh, again, we would love to have, uh, to be able to provide them with more um, mental health um, help, but at the moment we're unable. And finally, we also have classes for children, which is basically the same thing, but tailored more to kids. Uh, again, to, for them to find their value of self, for them to understand that their outcome doesn't have to be, uh, it, it's not determined by where they come from. Right. You know, uh, that they learn that they can achieve their dreams to keep dreaming because that is one thing we've seen uh, with people in in such a desperate type of poverty. Life is just what it is. You will always be like your dad was, I don't know, a cobbler and that's what you're going to be. It doesn't matter if you wanted to be a dancer or whatever. And people don't get that chance of dreaming of being more or striving for something more. Uh, but we are trying to teach them, trying to help them see that there's life, uh, that there's many different things in life that they can like aspire to. Yeah. yeah. I, I say it as we're expanding their worldview because if you grew up in, you know, the back end of volcanoes here in Vallarta, your worldview might exist for a couple of colonias in every direction. Mm -hmm. Outside of that area, you may not know that Guadalajara exists. Oh, yeah. It's a place you've heard of it. You know, it's probably on a map and it exists in, in, in kind of an abstract thing. But what you've got to do is find, you know, other people, other cultures and kind of give them as much exposure to stuff like that as we can. So then there's also, well, this is a real place. I could go there. I don't have to stay here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I could go and do this. I could go and do that. Just because it's not here doesn't mean I can't go out and do it. Yeah. yeah. So expanding people's worldview is something we try to do and expanding their base of education, even if it's just to provide you with a foundation to know things, you know, the basic math and reading and, and, and basic, you know, writing in your own language, that's big time important that's yeah, a sure. huge skill jump and that is our next goal i think for our educational programs we are not and we will never aspire to be a school but we do want to have remedial courses for people because we do see that here over and over people and kids who have who are like 15 year old and they never, they never went to school they don't have the ability to be signed up to a normal school because the school won't take them you know, because they are much older. So they just don't have a chance to go to school anymore, well, even if they wanted to. There's also adults that stopped going to school in the fourth or fifth grade right. and started working because that's what they had to do to survive. But now maybe they have the ability or a little more time they could go back and learn and, and get those remedial courses covered. The The idea is to to give people a solid foundation whether they're adult or, or teenager, because I've seen a lot of teenagers that, you know, they stop going to school, fourth, fifth grade, somewhere in that territory. So giving them a better foundation where they can get, what's the, it's like a GED. It's not a diploma, but it's a, it's kind of the same thing. What we'd call a GED, like a, GED. Like a completion, like you're, you're high school educated. Right. Right. While that's not as good as a diploma, it's better than not having anything at all that can severely limit your job prospects. Yeah. Understood. Definitely. Yeah. Well, you've got a full plate. Yeah. Do you, um, you really have a big challenge ahead too. And, um, I think the listeners here, uh, understand that. So, uh, once again, tell me, um, how do you give, uh, you can donate via our website, viartacares.org. And you can donate in pesos or in dollars. You can donate through our PayPal at Vallarta Cares. And uh, you can donate through our uh, QR codes that are in the city in different restaurants and different areas. Or you can just come here and donate directly to us. Excellent. And the the new platform that we're going to have with MyChange, where MyChange, you can donate yeah. uh, the Roundup cents 
from your credit card. We're going to have the link. I'm going to give it to Barry here. Very good. Very, very good. All right, well, you guys, um, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for everything that you do, because what you do is amazing. I can't even imagine the hours, <laughs> the hours that you put into this and the the heartbreak and the back break and the everything break. I mean, it is amazing. You two are just fantastic. And uh, uh, I think um, a lot of this town owes a lot to you. Um, and uh, so with that, uh, keep that in mind. Remember, it is Vallarta Cares. We are not long, no longer Vallarta Food Bank. And um, I'll have the links to all those things in the show notes. So, Jimmy, and oh, uh, something else? I want to say just yeah. one more thing. Um, a lot of people have always commented that we're doing a lot, that maybe we're spending too much. I think we're doing a lot with very little that we have. Not every program, I know we have a lot of programs, but not every program costs us a ton of money. We try to use the money that gets donated to to us very wisely. We try to budget, obviously. We try to find better prices for the things we do buy. But mostly we um, create alliances, strategic alliances with other associations, with other schools, with a lot of people in order to get what we have. Yeah. For example, the, the doctor and the dental clinic, both are students doing their um, social work. Uh, the classes that we have, are done through the Municipal Institute for Women and through another association called Fundación Crescento. We are we're not everything. We cannot. We know we cannot do everything on our own. So we're trying to really use our all of our skills in order to help people in the best way we can without trying to overextend ourselves. Yeah, and it sounds exactly like what you're doing. You. It's amazing. It's amazing how you do it, what you do with what you have. And I'm just totally impressed. Um, Jimmy, Frankie, thank you so much for coming on the show again. Thank you so much for uh, giving uh, me the opportunity to uh, introduce Viarta Cares to my listeners. I truly appreciate that. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Jimmy and Frankie. It is absolutely amazing. <laughs> to see and hear all about what you guys are doing there for the community. It just blows me away. And I'm sure it blows all you away too. Um, they really care about Vallarta. And I guess that's uh, why it's uh, such a good name, that Vallarta Cares name. I have uh, all the links in the show notes uh, to make it easy to uh, to get to their website and the many ways to give money and time uh, or both, uh, um, or one of each, to this fine organization. Once again, Vallarta Cares in Puerto Vallarta, Mexico. All right, well, that should do it for this week. Uh, next week, stay tuned for more on-the-ground reports from Puerto Vallarta, Mexico, with travel tips, great restaurant excursion ideas, and more. Until then, though, remember that this is an interactive show where I depend on your questions and your suggestions about all things Puerto Vallarta, and if you think of something that I should be talking about, well, please reach out to me by clicking on the Contact Us tab and sending us a message. And remember, if you're considering booking any type of tour while you're in Puerto Vallarta, well, you must go to ViartaInfo.com, that's JR's website, and reserve your tour through him right from his website. Remember, this is a value-for-value value proposition. His experience and on-the-ground knowledge of everything Puerto Vallarta in exchange for your making a purchase of a tour that you do anyway. You're just doing it through him as a way of saying thanks. Thank you, JR, for being our guide. It costs no more than if you're going to use someone else. Just do it, really. And when you do take one of those tours, email me about your experiences. Maybe you can come on board and share with others what you liked or didn't like about the tour. Again, contact me by clicking on the Contact Us tab and sending off a message. Hey, don't forget, he's got his maps, his DIY tours, and I have links to all of those in the show notes. And once again, if you like this podcast, please take the time and subscribe, follow, and share with a lover of Puerto Vallarta, or hey, give me a good review wherever you happen to be listening. That way we can get the word out to more and more people about the magic of this place, Puerto Vallarta, Mexico. Remember, I made it easy for you to all do that with each episode I create. But if you haven't been to my website, what's wrong with you? Get over there. You really have to take a look. I have 
links to places that we talk about, interesting pictures, and more right there in the blog post and the show notes for the show. So check them out for sure if you haven't already. All right. All right. Well, hey, thank you to Edgar Rivas for the Masters Festival. Get out there to park your dog with us Saturday and Sunday and have some brews. It's a really great time when Edgar throws a party. Yep, thank you so much, Frankie and Jimmy over at My Archer Cares. I have links in the show notes to hook you up with them. And thanks again for all you do for our community, Frankie and Jimmy. Uh, and thanks to all of you for listening all the way through this episode of the Parking Life Travel Show. This is Barry Kessler signing off with a wish for you all to slow down, be calm, and live the My Archer Cares lifestyle. Nos vemos, amigos. Samba de Puerto Vallarta. Noche de arroyo en el mar. Samba de Puerto Vallarta. Yeah.